Welcome to the church family that is lifting lives through living love, inspiring hope, filling with faith, and transforming our world. These recorded messages are made available so that you might have additional opportunities to stay connected with us, and then you might learn and grow in your faith. God bless you as you hear the word today. And now, the message. Our scripture reading for this morning is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. If you were here last week, um, today's really kind of a part two of last week's sermon. I encourage you to go back and listen to it online or on the podcast. And that's because, well, the creation story that we're considering today is part two of, uh, of, of really a story we heard last week. Last week, we looked at Genesis 1, which tells the story of creation on this epic cosmic scale. Six days in which God speaks into being all that it is in, the, in, in, in all the wide universe. And then in, in Genesis 2 chapter, in, in Genesis 2 and 3, we, we kind of get the second part of creation story in which we zoom in with a telescopic lens on a particular place and a particular set of people in who, with whom God lives in relationship. And so as we kind of do this, I, I kind of want to look back at just a quick recap of what we talked about last week. Um, and, and I gave credit last week, and I got to do it again, that a lot of the thought behind this week and last week's sermon comes from Andy Crouch, one of my favorite books, Playing God. It's pretty dense, but, uh, but it really opened my eyes to a lot of things in the Genesis story and elsewhere in Scripture. And, and in particular, what we looked at last week was the grammar of God's speech, God speaks the world into being, but I'd never before considered the grammar of that. When God speaks in Genesis chapter 1, he doesn't create by command, by fiat, by dictate. Make it so. Make it happen. Instead, how does God speak? When he calls forth creation, he says, let there be. Grammatically speaking, it's not an imperative. It's a justive. God opens up space in which new possibilities, new creatures can emerge. In other words, it's, it's not a command, it's a call to which creation joyfully and obediently responds. And after six days of let there be, let there be, let there be, then the divine voice changes again from justive to cohortative, from let there be to let us make. And here, the divine voice changes to personal, intimate. God gets his hands muddy, takes direct action in the creating and the crafting of image bearers, you and me, who will bear his divine image, be his agents, his co-creators, and in, in, in shepherding and tending for this creation which he has brought into being. And to these image bearers, then he speaks finally a command, except it's not do this, don't do that. Instead, it's be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, be agents of teeming, shepherding and tending creation in order to bring forth a bounty, abundance, a multiplication of the good which I have begun. So that's what it means to be an image bearer 
to bear God's image. It's that we are created in order to speak our own. Let there be and let us make to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, as you see, even though Genesis 2 chapter in Genesis 2 and 3, it kind of zooms in on a particular person and place, you see that same pattern of thought. It begins with let there be. God creates space, the Garden of Eden. And he fills that space just as he did with all creation, with every good and possible thing. And then when it gets to the creation of the very first human being, it gets let us make. God gets his hand dirty down in the mud. He breathes life lip to lip into Adam. And the name Adam is highly symbolic because it comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which means earth. So Adam is created out of Adama. And the creation of Eve is equally intimate, right? A rib is taken from Adam's side so that Adam would declare, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And why is Eve created? Because God recognizes that his image bearers need a partner so that they can speak, let us make, so that they can have the same kind of community in order to partner in creation together. And then God blesses them and says, be fruitful, and multiply, enjoy all the good things of this garden that I have given you, name all the animals. But in Genesis chapter two, God adds a boundary. He gives them a limit. He says, but there is a tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and of its fruit you must not eat or you will die. And we know as soon as a boundary is introduced, we know where this story is going, don't we? And so in the next chapter, Genesis chapter 3, a new character enters the story, the serpent. And this is the first time someone speaks besides God in the creation story, and we discover something new. Yes, words can be used to create, just like God brings forth being, but words can also be used to twist and corrupt creation. The serpent says, did God really say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? Just asking the question, he plants a seed of doubt in Adam and Eve's minds as to the goodness of God. Is he really generous? Is he really merciful? Does he really want you to have a full and abundant life? Or is he trying to keep something from you? Now, Eve doesn't bite initially. She says, no, 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 we can eat anything, any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, if we ate it, we'll die. And then the serpent says, you shall not die, but you will, when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. It's important to note, the serpent doesn't lie, he twists. Because it is true, Adam and Eve don't immediately die. The apple or whatever the fruit is, it's not poisonous. And he also speaks the truth because when they eat of it, their eyes are opened. Because up until this moment, everything they've known was good. Good, 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 good. And now they know something new, evil. And the way they know it is because they did it themselves. And what happens is the image bearing for which they were created gets twisted and torn and made into something different because they have misused the gift, the free will, the authority that God has given them over creation. They've used it for personal benefit rather than caring and tending for and following the instructions of the Lord. And so what does this do? How does the image get twisted inside of them? I go back to what I said last week, a quote from Andy Crouch. He said, it is the maker's desire to fill the earth with representatives who will have the same kind of delighted dominion over the teeming creatures as their maker. To me, those words, delighted dominion, that's what it means to be image bearers. Let's unpack this just a little bit. First, let's take the word dominion. Because God says, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every living thing that moves upon the earth. That word dominion in Hebrew is rada. It refers to the rulership, the authority of a king. 
We see it lots of places in the Old Testament. The one I want to draw your attention to is Psalm 72, which is a coronation psalm. Whenever a king, King Solomon and all the kings that followed, whenever they were crowned king, Psalm 72 would have been read over them. And it says, may he, the king, have dominion. May he have rada from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. And the reason I lift up Psalm 72 is because when you think about rulership and authority, you think about power. But if you go to the end of Psalm 72, we get a description of what Radha looks like. The king delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. That's what Radha looks like. We see it again, the same picture of kingship in in Ezekiel 34, where the prophet is, is railing against the kings of Israel because they have misused their authority. He says, you haven't strengthened the weak. You have not healed the sick. You have not bound up the injured. You have not brought back the stray. You have not sought the lost, but with force and harshness, you have ruled them. In other words, you have totally misunderstood the rada, the dominion that God gave you. It's not for force and harshness. It's so that you can strengthen the weak and heal the sick and bound up the injured and seek out the lost. In other words, God gives dominion to kings and to all of us as image bearers. He gives us rada so that we would care for creation that we would protect the weak and vulnerable, that we would bind up anything that is hurt or injured. That's the purpose of our dominion. And then you have that word delight. Remember, it's delighted dominion. And again, going back to Genesis chapter two, God wants us to delight in creation. When he crafts the Garden of Eden, it says, out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. He wants Adam and Eve to enjoy the gifts of creation. Just like a king receives bounty from the land over which he has dominion. In the same way we as as Image bearers with the rada of God. We're to receive bounty from the places where we care for because what we delight in, we care for. I was trying to think of an example of like, where's a place where I have delighted dominion? And the example that came to my mind was my pets. I don't know how many of you have pets. I have complete dominion over them, right? Like, well, complete. I still can't get them to stop jumping up on people. You know, I can't, or or barking at other dogs. It's it's so embarrassing, like we're walking around the neighborhood. I can't quite reel them in. But I know I have dominion over them. I'm responsible to feed and care for them and to shape their behavior and to train them. But but part of it is I have delight in them. They bring me joy and delight. and, And you can't separate one from the other. The delight is just as important as the dominion. It's holding them together that matters. Or like I especially love the picture on the right of my son playing cards with Sammy when he was just a puppy. And the reason I like that picture on the right is because it reminds me of another important area where I have rada, where I have delighted dominion. And it's funny, and the reason I hold that up is because I know at some point my rada is going to come to an end. I will not have dominion over my kids. My daughter already has her driver's license. It's started already, people. But I hope that long after my rada is gone, that I still take delight in the people I helped raise them to be. And I would contend that the delight in my children is so much more important and lasting than the dominion that I was given for the, over them for a season. You following me? Delight and dominion, that's what image bearing looks like. That's what we're created for. That when we make the same choice as Adam and Eve, when we misuse our rada, our image bearing is twisted. And so our dominion becomes domination. 
Domination is, is power which doesn't lift others up but instead puts others down. Rather than expanding the gifts and multiplying the gifts of others, it seeks to expand its own power through control and manipulation. Domination is dominion without servanthood. Follow me? Dominion, you take away servanthood, you get domination. And what happens to delight? Well, delight gets twisted into exploitation. And what I mean by that word exploitation is whenever we use a portion of creation, whether it's people or places or things, whenever we use something and treat it as disposable, we just use it up, throw it away, and move on to the next thing. And we leave what we've left, whatever it is that we used, we leave it diminished all the less good than it was when we first found it. That's exploitation. It's use without care. And so whenever you take delight and dominion and you subtract out servanthood and care, you get domination and exploitation. In other words, when you subtract out the divine, Love, care, servanthood. What you're left with is a twisting of the rod of the authority, the image bearing that God created us to bear. You following me? And I think just, just as I said, every single one of us can probably think of some place where we have delighted dominion on earth. My bet is that every single one of us can name some time, a memory or experience where we've experienced either domination or exploitation. A boss who domineered over our life. A friend who stabbed us in the back. A parent, a trusted person who who abused. Uh, An addiction, a substance that we can't get the mastery over. A mistake that perhaps we made ourselves. And if we go far enough, it's not just that we can remember what's been done to us, that maybe we, we can remember a time where we misused a gift that was given to us, where we ruled over, domineered without serving, where we used up without caring or conserving. That's image bearing gone wrong. Andy Crouch writes, thousands of years after Genesis was written, We can see in a way its first readers never could have imagined just how much capacity these image bearers had to fill the earth, just how much power was ultimately available to them. Think about how much we know and understand about creation, how we've been able to split apart atoms and and, and, and study the genome, what we've been able to harness for good. Like We've been able to shape the world around us. We are truly image bearers, co-creators with God, but there's a big but that Genesis 2 and 3 tells us. And so I continue. He says, but we also know that on the very next page of the Bible is a tragic twist in the story. The original image bearers flaunt their freedom in the garden, abandon their original vocation, and the result is diminishing, not flourishing. Their own and the whole created orders as dominion and delight turn to domination and exploitation. And here too today, we see the inexpressible horror of the full playing out of the story in dimensions and its scales of which the first readers of Genesis were mercifully innocent. Here too today. The writers of Genesis could have never envisioned something like 9-11, could they? I mean, they would have never had any idea how much power was available to us or how much that power could be used to hurt and harm. But this is what it means to be human beings. To always have good and always have evil close at hand to walk along that line and have the choice continuously available to us. And sometimes we all make the choice to do evil, to do harm, rather than to do good. We, 
we lose a little bit of the image of God that he created us to bear. That's what sin is. Sin is when we take the authority, the rada, the image that God has given us, the free will, and instead of using it to glorify and honor God, in order to tend and team for creation and love, we use it for our own purposes, for our own benefit, to rebel against the authority of God, to play God ourselves. So what does God do? Does God drop the hammer on us, put us in our place? Does God say, hey, I'm gonna come down there and show you who's really king? Well, yeah, in a way. Because we believe that in the fullness of time, God did come. He sent his son to be his true image bearer. To show us what Radha truly looks like. When you think about Jesus' ministry, he perfectly fulfilled the words of Psalm 72. He perfectly undid every prophecy that, that that Ezekiel made against the shepherds in Ezekiel 34. He sought out the weak. He bound up the injured. He, 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 he cared for the lost. He, he, he restored that which harshness and violence had damaged. And at the end of his life, he laid down his own life as a sacrifice, as an offering for the redemption of all creation. This is our picture of what Radha looks like. It looks like love. And it is God's love that truly restores his image within us. So back to our grammar lesson. Let there be, let us make, be fruitful and multiply. Andy Crouch suggests that the turning point of creation takes place when people and image bearers begin to speak back to God the same let there be that he first spoke over creation. When we speak let there be as a way of, of laying our lives before God, of submitting wherever is broken inside all of us and letting God do something new in and through us. He writes, as Christians we have the great privilege of reading this story, Genesis 2, from the perspective of its most decisive chapter, and we know that all is not lost. For in the fullness of time, two image bearers uttered their own let it be back to the creator. First, a young woman called herself the handmaiden of the Lord, saying, let it be unto me according to your word. She made room for the one true image of the invisible God to take on visible flesh, And then her son in a garden on the night before his death also prayed, yet not my will but thine be done. Let it be. They returned to the humble power of the Joseph. And there at the turning point of history, the promise of true image bearing, true flourishing, true power was restored. If you are aware of any part of your life this morning that needs restoration. A relationship that's gone broken, a place where your power has gone awry, a balance between work and home, or even a, a sense of wholeness in your body and your spirit. If, if, if that's something you need or want, let me suggest to you that it begins by responding to God with the same words that he spoke over us, of simply saying to God, let, her, let there be laying before God whatever is broken in our hearts and saying, let there be in me, let there be in this, whatever it is you want to see. And allowing God to speak his own let there be over our broken lives. To allow God to say, let us make something new out of that which is broken and trusting that God can bring something beautiful and good out of the mess that we've made. There's an old hymn that I grew up singing in the church where I, where I grew up. I'm sure most of you know it. And I'm always amazed at how one little verse can sometimes capture what I spend over 20 minutes trying to explain. But I invite you, if you know the words, join with me. 
Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strife. But he made something beautiful of my life. Amen. Say, let there be to God and trust that he can and will make something beautiful with you. Good morning. My name is Peggy Reef, and I am the Administrative Assistant here at Zionsville United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We would love to get to know you more and spend some time with you. If you'd like to know more about our faith community, please visit our church website at zumc.org. There, you'll find the many ministry opportunities we have to offer. If you need to contact one of our staff members, all our contact information is at the bottom of each web page. You can also connect with us via social media throughout your week for daily inspiration and community. You'll find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube under username Zionsville UMC. Once again, thank you for joining us this morning, and we hope you have a wonderful week.